Our Father who is in heaven, good morning, Father. You're that heavenly Father we always long for. Jesus, you're that big brother we've all wanted. Holy Spirit, welcome. Hallowed be your name. In our worship this morning, in our work and family and play this week, may we treat your name as holy. Hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come. King Jesus, we want to follow you. Help us to follow the king. Help us to spread the good news of the king. King Jesus, we look forward to that day when you come back and your kingdom is here in all of its fullness. Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Holy Spirit, fall fresh on us. Incline our hearts to do your will, that we would delight in following you. Lord, we pray for a revival in your church. We pray for a spiritual awakening in our land. We long to see your will done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. You know our financial needs as families and individuals and as a church meet our needs. Meet all of our physical needs. We need you. And we have relational needs too. So, Lord, forgive us our debts as we also forgive our debtors. We're going to pause and confess our sins to you. And, Lord, as you forgive us so much, help us to forgive those that have wronged us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Lord, deliver us from the evil that's inside us, our flesh. Lord, deliver us from the world that's always trying to squeeze us into its mold. Lord, deliver us from the evil one who's always seeking to deceive us. We pray as we open your word together today that you would teach us. And we pray in Jesus' name, amen. Our scripture reading this morning is from Colossians uh, chapter um, 4. This is God's word, and we're going to read verses 2 through 4. Devote yourselves to prayer, keeping alert in it with an attitude of thanksgiving, praying at the same time for us as well that God will open up to us a door for the word so that we may speak forth the mystery of Christ, for which I have also been in prison, that I may make it clear in the way I ought to speak. There is a little town in North Texas called Mount Vernon, and there's a bar there called Drummond's Bar. And Drummond's Bar was trying to expand their facility, but there was a local Baptist church that opposed the expanding of the bar. So they protested against it and they petitioned against it, but the bar continued to expand. Uh, And and about a week before the bar was to open its new extension, lightning struck from uh, the skies and burned up the bar. Um, the, The church members were pretty smug that the bar had been burned down until the owner of the bar sued the church saying the church was either directly or indirectly responsible for the demise of the building. A charge that the church vehemently denied. (laughs) So as the paperwork made its way to court, the judge reads the paperwork, and he says, I don't know how I'm going to decide this case, but the best I can understand it, I have a bar owner who believes in the power of prayer. <laughs> and I've got a whole congregation that denies the power of prayer. <laughs> oh, prayer. That's what we're going to learn about this morning, about being devoted to prayer. Listen, if you're new here, welcome. We're walking through a book in the Bible called Colossians because it's all about Jesus. And if you'd like to know Jesus, come and see him with us. Each week we're coming and learning about Jesus, and it's so full of Jesus. And what we've learned this year is that a Christian is a follower of Jesus. What we've learned this year is that when Jesus moves into us, his intention is not to change something in our lives. He wants to change everything in our lives. He wants to change our worship. He wants to change our marriage. He wants to change our family. He wants to change our workplace. He wants to change our prayer life. 
Because when Jesus says, follow me, he becomes our model for life and ministry. And I'm really excited about what we're going to learn about today. The, the point of today's message is we get to pray. Would you say that with me? We get to pray. You know why we're going to start with the, the get to in that? Because as Christians, we have an amazing ability to turn gifts of God into burdens. We have an amazing ability to take gifts from God and make them a burden. <laughs> In the Old Testament, all the nations worked seven days a week. They worked seven days a week, and God gave his people a day off. You can take a day off, and I'll take care of you. And the Israelites turned the Sabbath into a burden. Oh. <laughs> people often say, well, Smiley, I mean, I'm a Christian. Do I have to go to church? If you're a Christian, you don't have to do anything. Are you kidding me? We get to come to church. We live in a culture that's lost its mind. And on Sunday, we get to gather with like-minded people, and we get to hear His Word together. People will say things to me. Do we have to read the Bible? If you're a Christian, you don't have to do anything. It's the Word of God. You own a copy of the Word of God. We get to read His Word and hear God speak. Do I have to pray? No, you don't have to pray. You mean you can talk to Jesus and you don't want to? We get to pray. Um, sometimes we forget. Listen, the word gospel means good news. The gospel is the best news the world has ever heard, that eternal life is a free gift from God. It's a free gift from God. It's not earned or deserve. It's a free gift. We receive my faith. Yes, the gospel has some bad news in it, uh, in Romans 6, <clears throat> verse 23, notice this verse, for the wages of sin is death. The bad news of the gospel, see the word sin, we have a sin problem. I can't tell you how many people I've talked to, and I say, well, why should God let you into heaven? And they say, I've never hurt anyone. <laughs> how would you respond to that? Come on. Can I talk to your mom? Can I talk to your spouse? You've never hurt anyone? Are you kidding me? But you know what most people don't realize is sin is not primarily against others. It's primarily against God. The thought that a sin is a crime against God is something that hasn't entered into the minds of most people. Maybe you. When we don't put God first, that's a crime against God. When we don't honor our mother and father, that's a crime against God. When we don't reserve sex for marriage, that's a crime against God. When we tell a lie, that's a crime against God. When we want other people to have, that's a crime against God. And we're all guilty of crime after crime against God. See, that's the word sin. Now, notice the word wages. Sometimes people tell me, well, all I want from God is what I deserve. And I'll say, the one thing you don't want from God is what you deserve. Because the Bible says that the wages of sin is death. See the word death, it means separation. And it's not just speaking about physical death, which is the separation of our body and spirit from one another. But it's speaking of eternal death. That's what hell is. It's a separation from God and from all good things. The bad news of the gospel is if God gave us what we deserve it would be to be separated from Him and from all good things in hell forever. Once we understand the bad news, the good news is so good. See, for the wages of sin is death, here's the good news. We can get what we don't deserve. Instead of wages, we can get a free gift. But the free gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. See, Jesus didn't come to earth to help good people get better. God the Son left heaven, put on flesh, came to earth, and He lived a perfect life for us. And then he went to the cross, and he took our sin, and he paid the penalty. He took the wages of sin that's death. He died in our place once and for all, paying in full the penalty for our sins, crying out, it is finished. He died, he was buried, and then he rose on the third day, and he offers us eternal life. He offers to forgive all of our sins. He offers to save us from hell so that we could enjoy Him every day of our lives and we could enjoy Him now and forever. And what does He require of us to receive this free gift? That we receive Him as our Savior and Lord. Have you? Oh, listen to this. The verse that changed my life, Revelation 3.20, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. 
If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will commend him and dine with him and he with me. Um, if you've never received the free gift, won't you? One day, it, it'll be too late. Don't wait until it's too late. So how do we receive Jesus as our Savior and Lord? There was a day where I admitted that I had sinned against God. And listen, if, if you've never done that, won't you do the, that now? Or I'd be glad to give you a chance as we close in prayer. But I just said, Lord, I've sinned against you, and I'm sorry, won't you? And then I believed. I said, Jesus, I believe you died on the cross for my sins, won't you? And then I committed to Jesus as Savior and Lord. Jesus, be my Savior and forgive me and give me eternal life. And he did, won't you? And I want you to be Lord of my life. Help me be the person you want me to be, won't you? And you know what happened? When I did that, Jesus did just what he said. He said, behold, I stand at the door knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come in to him and will dine with him and he with me. Jesus moved into me and Jesus forgave me. And we've been doing life together ever since that day. I know Jesus and he knows me and we get to do life together. And when Jesus moves into us, he says, follow me, follow me. And we say, well, how do we do that? He becomes our model for life and ministry. He gives us the Holy Spirit to help us follow Him. He gives us His Word so we can know Him. He gives us prayer so we can talk to Him. Listen, we get to pray. Back to our passage. Notice in verse 2, devote yourselves to prayer. Notice verse 3, praying kind of raises the question of, well, what is prayer? What is prayer? Prayer is talking with God. Prayer is talking with God that Jesus speaks to us primarily through His Word, and then we speak to Him in prayer. That's communication, that, that He speaks to us through His Word, and then, and then we speak to Him through prayer. Prayer is not primarily something we do. It's someone we're doing life with. I have a friend, and we go everywhere together, and we talk all the time, and that's what prayer is. Let me show you that. In, in Colossians 3, remember when we read Colossians 3, verse 16, let the word of Christ richly dwell within you? You know why we love the Bible? It's all about Jesus. How do we know Jesus? We get to know Him in His Word. Let the Word of Christ richly dwell within you. So He, he speaks to us in prayer, right? Or He speaks to us in His Word, and then we respond back in prayer. I love the way someone said it, that we inhale Scripture, and then we exhale prayer. And that's how we walk with Him, that we get to know Him in His Word, and that's how we get to know Him, and then we speak to Him in prayer. So we get to pray. <laughs> prayer is not primarily something that we do. It's someone that we're with. Now, now continuing on in verse 4, devote yourselves. The word devote there means the idea, do this continually. Be devoted to it. So devote yourselves to prayer. Continue in prayer. To which people will often ask me the question, well, Smiley, should we have set times of prayer or should we pray all the time? Should we have set times or should we pray all the time? What would you say? Yes, right? It's really good to have set times where it's just Jesus and I together. That's really good. But it's also good then to talk with Him throughout the day. Devote yourselves to prayer. <clears throat> now, what does that look like? Remember <clears throat> Pentecost... Uh, Pentecost happened, the Holy Spirit fell, Peter preached, 3,000 people were saved. 3,000 people were saved in, in, in one event. And, and what did these new Christians do? What did they do when, when Jesus moved into them, when the Spirit moved into them? What did they do? In Acts chapter 2, they were continually devoting themselves. Now, now notice here, they were devoting themselves. It doesn't, they, they didn't say, well, what do, do we have to do this? They wanted to. They were continually devoting themselves to the apostles' teaching. They didn't have the New Testament, but they had the apostles, and so they gathered. Tell us about Jesus. Tell us about Jesus. Are, are we like that? When Sunday comes, are we out of our mind excited that we get to come to church and have someone 
Teach us about Jesus. Please, do we get up in the morning and open our Bible saying, would you, Jesus, just teach us about you. They were continually devoting themselves to the apostles' teaching. Oh, I love God's word because it's all about Jesus. They were continually devoting themselves to the apostles' teaching and to fellowship. Do you know what happened to the Jewish people who put their faith in Christ? Do you know what happened? Their families disowned them. Their families disowned them. You know why they loved gathering together? Because they had a new family with like-minded people. Do you ever feel like you don't belong in our culture? Ever feel that way? Man, I love being together with like-minded people, don't you? This is where I belong. I, I belong in this church, don't you? They were devoting themselves to fellowship because that was the place where they belonged. That's where they had community. That's where like-minded people were. It wasn't in their culture. It wasn't even their families. Their families disowned them. But they were continually devoting themselves to the apostles' teaching and to fellowship, to the breaking of bread. They loved to eat together and do life together and to prayer. <laughs> They were continually praying together. We see that theme in the book of Colossians as we've been reading through it together. Remember when we were back in chapter 1 in Colossians 1 verse 9? For this reason also, since the day we heard of it, we have not ceased to pray for you. The we is Paul and Timothy. Paul and Timothy say, man, from the first time we heard about you, we are continually praying to you. We have not ceased to pray for you. Or how about where we'll be in a couple of weeks in, in chapter 4, verse 12. Epaphras, who was the one who started the church in Colossae. Epaphras, who is one of your number, a bond slave of Jesus Christ, sends you his greetings, always laboring earnestly for you in his prayers. <laughs> prayers work, isn't it? Man, Epaphras loved the church there so much that he was always laboring earnestly for you in his prayers, always praying. Uh, so why? Why are we to pray continually? Why, why is it such a big deal that we, we get to pray? Uh, well, let me give you two reasons. One is delight and the other is dependence. Why do we want to pray continually? Because we get to spend time with our best friend, Jesus. That's why we delight in it. But also, because of dependence, we need Jesus. And doesn't Jesus model this for us, doesn't he? In Mark chapter 1, verse 35, In the early morning, while it was still dark, Jesus got up left the house, and went away to a secluded place and was praying there. Have, have you, you ever read the Gospels? Once the day started in Jesus' life, what was it like? Once the day started, it was what? It was crazy. There was crowds and people around all the time. But man, he loved that time with the Father and the Spirit. So in the early morning, while it was still dark, Jesus got up and left the house and went away to a secluded place secluded place. Why did he do that? Because he delighted in the time with his Father and Spirit. It was his delight. He enjoyed it. But it was also about dependence, wasn't it? Because Jesus always did the will of his Father. He need, needed to know what the Father wanted him to do. He models for us how to walk in dependence upon the Holy Spirit. So it was a matter of delight and dependence. What if, what if we thought that prayer was about delight and dependence? How about delight? Wouldn't we want to pray then? Look at Psalm 16, verse 11. You will make known to me the path of life. The reason we spend time with Jesus is that's where we learn the path of life. Listen, to in your presence is fullness of joy. Wow. I can't wait till I get a chance to pray today because, listen, that's where I find the fullness of joy. In your right hand there are pleasures forever. Um, our daughter-in-law, Megan, recently had surgery and uh, so Karen called her this week uh, and said, how was it? She says, oh, it was great. And I said, how long did you guys talk? Now, I want you to know, if you haven't figured it out yet, I'm a guy, okay? I'm a guy. And I asked her, how long did you talk? You know what she said? On the phone. I'm talking about on the phone. An hour and a half. We talked for an hour. How could anybody spend an hour and a half on the phone? She said, we had no problem at all.
what if we were like that with Jesus? Oh, we so enjoy being with our best friend. We delighted in that. That's where the fullness of joy is, that we just spent time with him, and the time just went away because we were with him. Listen, praying continually is about delight, that we enjoy being with our best friend. But it's also about dependence, isn't it? We spend time with him because we need him. In John 15, verse 5, remember what Jesus said? He said, I am the vine, you are the branches. He who abides in me and I in him, he bears much fruit. For apart from me, you can do nothing. If you've been with us, we've been learning how Jesus is our model for life and ministry. <laughs> in the last few weeks, we've learned that he's our model for marriage. So if you're a wife, the Scripture calls you to be subject to your husband's. Isn't that why you pray, Lord, help? And if you're a husband, all we're asked to do is to love our wives like Christ loved the church. Lord, help. And then we read about children. We read, children, obey your parents. Lord, help. We read about fathers, dads. You're to be involved in fathering your children. Lord, help. And then last week we learned what? That if we're employees, we're to work hard for our boss, whether they're there or not. Lord, help. And we learned if we're an employer, we're to treat our employees, what, with, with justice and fairness. Lord, help. And that's just, <laughs> that's just how he's our model for life. He's also our model for ministry. And that's what he's talking about here, that we pray that God would open doors. Huh. Let me show you a verse that really helps us understand how delight and dependence go together. It's in Mark chapter 3. This is, this is so good. So Jesus spent the night in prayer, and then he appointed 12. So he picked his 12 apostles. Now notice why. And he appointed 12 so that they would be with him. So Jesus gave these guys the opportunity to be his friends. <laughs> And he had a purpose for their life too, right? And that he could send them out to preach. That, that, that's us. Listen, Jesus has called us so that we could do life with him. We get to do life with our best friend. So that's delight. But he also has a purpose for our lives. And we spend time with him because we're dependent on him because he wants to send us out to preach the gospel to others. So... Back to our passage, we've, we've learned what prayer is. It's, it's talking with God and devote yourselves to prayer. Listen, pray continually. It's about delight and, and dependence, keeping alert in it. Stay awake. Uh, well, why is that? Listen, prayer is not a domestic intercom. It's not a domestic intercom given to us for our comfort. It is a wartime walkie-talkie. It's a wartime walkie-talkie because when we hook our wagon to Jesus and we say we want to follow you, we're involved in a great spiritual battle. The battle goes on inside of us. It's a battle against the flesh, the sinful nature we were born with. It's a battle against the world around us that's always trying to squeeze us into its mold. And it's a battle against the devil who's always trying to deceive us. And that's why we pray continually, because we want to stay alert. Um, didn't Jesus model this for us as well? As he was approaching the cross the night before in Matthew 26, you remember the story, don't you? The, 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 the night before, after the Lord's Supper, verse 36, Then Jesus came with them to a place called Gethsemane and said to his disciples, Sit here while I go over there and pray. And he took with him Peter and the two sons of Zebedee and began to be grieved and distressed. Then he said to them, My soul is deeply grieved to the point of death. I am overwhelmed. Remain here and keep watch with me. Stay alert. Stay alert. Watch and pray. Watch and pray. Watch and pray. Um, so what did the disciples do? They what? They slept. And then what happened when the, when the army came, what? They ran away because they didn't watch and pray. They failed. What did Jesus do? He watched and prayed, right? And, and, and when the soldiers came, what? He, he walked in obedience to his father because he stayed alert. Uh, do we? 
Listen, the passage says to devote yourselves to prayer, keeping alert in it. We stay alert because we need Jesus to overcome the flesh, the world, and the devil. Keeping alert in it with an attitude of thanksgiving. <laughs> we get to pray. I can't believe we get to do this. It's not, oh man, do I have to pray? It's we get to pray. Uh, I, want, I want to share with you four different ways that, that we can pray, okay? I, I like this acrostic because prayer, there, there's four kinds of prayer. There's adoration where we praise God for who He is, and then there's confession where we confess our sins and the sins of a, the church and of our country, and then there's thanksgiving where we thank Him for what He's done for us, and then there's supplication where we ask for things. So, so let's start with adoration. In Hebrews chapter 13, verse 15, through him then let us continually offer up a sacrifice of praise to God. I am so thankful to live in the New Testament, don't you? Because if you went to worship in the Old Testament, you know what you had to do? You had to what? Bring an animal. And you had to kill it. And it had to shed its blood, right? That's what you gave. And we don't have to kill animals, but there are sacrifices that we can lift up that are a pleasing aroma to God. And one of them is the sacrifice of praise. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, you are amazing. You are holy. You are love. Jesus, you're the bread of life. You're the light of the world. You're the way, the truth, and the life. There is no one like you. Holy Spirit, you're the comforter. You're the convictor. There is no one like you. Do you know when we praise God, that is a soothing aroma to Him? Through Him, then, let us continually offer up a sacrifice of praise. That is the fruit of lips to give thanks to His name. Uh, <clears throat> and then there's confession. When we look at God, then we look at ourselves differently, don't we? And so we confess our sins. In 1 John 1, 9, if we confess our sins, see the word confess, it means to agree with. When we agree with God that we have sinned, rather than blaming, justifying, or excusing, Lord, the way I treated my wife was wrong. It was a sin, and I'm sorry. If we confess our sins, He is faithful and righteous to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Well, Smiley, I thought when we believed in Jesus, we were already forgiven of our past and present and future sins. Why do we confess them? Because it's good for us to confess our sins. And when we do, we agree with God that what we're doing is wrong. And Jesus assures us, I have forgiven you, and I do forgive you. And then don't miss this. When we admit what we're, we've done, not only does He forgive us, but He cleanses us. When we confess our sins, that's part of being freed from our sin. So we confess our sins, and then we confess the sins of our church. Lord, uh, forgive us that we're casual in our worship toward you and forgive us that we're lukewarm. And Lord, forgive us we don't treasure you as we ought. And, and then we confess the sins of our nation. Uh, in, anybody else maybe in here brokenhearted over uh, our, our country? Uh, let me show you a verse in Second Chronicles. Um, we sometimes expect the nation to heal itself, and I want you to know it can't. Here's how nations are healed, and my people, who are called by my name, humble themselves and pray and seek my face. In America, we put way too much hope in the civil government, and we put way too little confidence in Jesus Christ. And the Bible says, when my people, who are called by my name, humble themselves and pray and seek my face, Jesus, you are our only hope, and turn. When God's people turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven. We'll forgive their sins and we'll heal their land. And so when I confess, I confess my sins and the sins of our church and the sins of our nation. Lord, you've been so good to us and we don't welcome you in our schools. Lord, you've been so good to us and, uh, and, and, and a child in our country is not safe in her mother's womb. Lord, forgive us. And and Lord, forgive us that, that we celebrate what you forbid. Lord, we have forgotten you. Lord, forgive our land. So 
part of prayer is confession. There's adoration, there's confession, and then there's thanksgiving. There's thanksgiving. That's what our passage says. Praying at the same time for us as or keeping alert in it with an attitude of thanksgiving. <laughs> Do you meet many thankful people today? Uh, would you like to stand out for all the right reasons? We can by being a, a, a thankful people. Thanksgiving runs throughout the Bible and throughout the book of Colossians. Remember when we were back in chapter 1? In chapter 1, verse 3, we give thanks to God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, praying always for you. So Paul would always say, we're thankful for you, and then we pray for these other things. <laughs> Listen, giving thanks continually. Paul says, we give thanks to the God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Are we thankful? Remember in chapter 2? Remember in chapter 2, we read in verses 6 and 7, Therefore, as you have received Christ Jesus the Lord, so walk in Him. You began by faith, you walk by faith, having been firmly rooted and now being built up in Him and established in your faith just as you were instructed and overflowing with gratitude. Are we overflowing with gratitude? Every day we walk with Jesus, we should be more thankful and more filled with gratitude than the day before. You know why? Because every day as a Christian, I find out two things. First of all, I'm a way bigger sinner than I knew the day before. And the second thing I understand is my Savior is so much more amazing than I ever imagined. I am so thankful for Jesus, aren't you? Oh. And then remember when we were in <clears throat> chapter 3, verse 15, Let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts, to which indeed you were called in one body, and be thankful. Jesus, thank you that you have given me peace with God. Thank you you've given me peace within. Thank you you've given me a growing peace with others. Thank you. Let the word of Christ richly dwell among you with all wisdom, teaching and admonishing one another with psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing with thankfulness in your hearts to God. Do you look forward to Sunday? Listen, Sunday we get together and with joy in our hearts sing thanks to God because sometimes words are not enough, so we sing to say thank you. And listen, what starts on Sunday doesn't stop on Sunday. Whatever you do in word or deed. Man, on Monday as you go to work, on Tuesday in your home, on Thursday when you're playing your favorite sport, whatever you do in word or deed, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, giving thanks through Him to God the Father. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Uh, there's that, there's there's adoration, there's confession, there's thanksgiving, and then there's supplication. Uh, there's supplication. Supplication means to ask for ourselves and for others. And notice what it says here, praying at the same time for us as well, that God will open up a door. Do you know why God delights in prayer? The reason God delights in prayer is that Christian life is lived in dependence upon Him, and every time we pray, we're acknowledging our neediness of Him. So notice Paul's prayer, praying at the same time for us as well that God will open up to us a door for the Word. Lord, open up a door for the Word so that we may speak forth the mystery of Christ, so that we might speak. And remember in chapter 1, we learned that the mystery of Christ was Christ in you, the hope of glory. That great truth that had been hidden, that's now been revealed, is that Jesus lives in people like you and me, Gentiles, right? that they might speak forth the mystery of Christ, the, the gospel for which I was also in prison, that I may make it clear in the way I ought to speak. Paul is in prison. And when Paul asks others to pray for him, notice what he, he doesn't pray, pray that I would be let out of prison. What he prays is the gospel, that the gospel would be unleashed. So what did Paul do when he was in prison? He wrote letters, right? And those letters got the word out, didn't they? And they're still impacting the world today. Um, do we pray for open doors? D do you know that that's a consistent theme in the New Testament? After Paul's first missionary journey, as he's giving in a report in Acts 14, verse 27, <clears throat> when they had arrived and gathered the church together, they had kind of a report back session, they began to report all the things that God had done with them and how he had opened a door of faith to the Gentiles. You won't believe what happened. 
We went to Gentiles. God opened a door, and Gentiles are coming to faith in Christ. They prayed for open doors, and God opened doors. Uh, how about in 1 Corinthians 16, verse 8? Uh, Paul writes, But I will remain in Ephesus until Pentecost, for a wide door to effective service has opened to me. I'm staying here. Because God has opened the door. There are many people here who want to come to faith in Christ. Notice, too, and there are many adversaries. So in Ephesus, what did Paul have? He had a wide open door and many adversaries. Isn't that true of our time? In my whole ministry, I've never seen a greater hunger for the gospel than there is today. There are people so interested in the gospel, but there's also a greater hostility. They're both true, and they're both true at the same time. A couple of chapters later, 2 Corinthians 2, verse 12, when I came to Troas for the gospel of Christ, notice he went there not on vacation or, or to see the place. He went there for the gospel. Now, when I came to Troas for the gospel and when a door was opened to me in the Lord, and, and God opened a door for him to share Christ with people there. How about in Ephesians 6? This is a twin epistle to Colossians. Ephesians 6, 18, with all prayer and petition, pray at all times in the Spirit. Pray, pray, pray. And with this in view, be on the alert. Stay alert with all perseverance and petition for all the saints. And pray on my behalf. Pray for me. Now notice what he asked prayer for, that utterance may be given to me in the opening of my mouth to make known with boldness the mystery of the gospel. We imagine the Apostle Paul was different than you and me. I mean, he was bold. He was courageous. He wasn't like us. No, no, he was just like us. Listen, what he always asked people is, pray for me. Pray for me that God would give me boldness, open doors, boldness. Don't we live in a time where we need boldness to speak the gospel, don't we? Uh, to make known with boldness the mystery of the gospel, for which I am an ambassador in change, that in proclaiming it, I may speak boldly as I ought to speak. Paul says, you pray for me, and I'll pray for you. Listen, will you pray for me, and I'll pray for you? Will you pray for me that God would open doors for me to share the gospel, and I'll pray for you that God would open doors for you? Will you pray for me for boldness? I am such a coward. I, I need your prayers. Will you pray for me, and I'll pray for you that you'd be bold? Would you pray for me that I would have the wisdom to make the gospel known clearly to people today? Will you pray for me? And, and, and I'll pray for you. Um, isn't that what we've been learning? Devote yourselves to prayer, keeping alert in it with an attitude of thanksgiving, praying at the same time for us as well, that God will open up to us a door for the word so that we, not just me, but that we may speak forth the mystery of Christ for which I have also been in prison that I may make it clear in the way I ought to speak. <laughs> so we've been learning we get to pray. We get to. It's not a have to. It's a get to. That We get to pray continually. It's both about delight and dependence. We want to keep alert. And, and as we pray, we, we want to have adoration and confession and, and uh, thanksgiving and supplication. And, and as we're asking for things, we want to pray for open doors and boldness and wisdom, right? Oh, <laughs> And so our action step, our action step for this week is so good. I want you to have a great week, so I want you to enjoy talking with Jesus this week. Uh, just to enjoy talking with Jesus. I, I can't believe we get to do this. Isn't that what we've been learning, devote yourselves to prayer? Um, the reason my favorite verse is Revelation 3.20 is it's not just the verse that I invited Jesus in, but it's really the picture of my Christian life. Jesus said to me, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice, I will come in to him and will dine with him. Don't you like to eat? Why wouldn't you want to eat with Jesus and, and dine with him and he with me? Right? <clears throat> Every morning when I get up, you know what? Jesus is sitting there with a cup of coffee. And he says, Can we spend time together? And if Jesus has time for me, how can I be too busy for him? Isn't that true too? And, uh, and when I meet with him, you know what? He teaches me in his word. Wasn't it good in 1 Corinthians this week? Wasn't that good? Matter of fact, we, we're learning to read the word and then 
Pray the word and show. So I was reading, for the word of the cross is to those who are perishing foolishness, but to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. And I was overwhelmed with thanksgiving. Thank you, Jesus, that when I heard the gospel, it wasn't foolishness. It is the power of God that has changed my life. Thank you. And then I began to pray, Lord, when I share the gospel with others, may it not be foolishness. May it be the power of God to save. I mean, you do know what the gospel is. We tell people, this guy died 2,000 years ago. And if you believe in him, you can be forgiven and live forever. We're not going to win them by our persuasiveness. We need the Spirit of God to move it from foolishness to the power of God to save, right? Um, and as I meet with Jesus... I, I try and have a prayer life that's balanced where there's adoration. Jesus, you're amazing. And then there's confession. <clears throat> and there's supplication. And then there's thanksgiving. And listen, when I pray with Jesus in the morning, I pray in ever-expanding circles, and maybe you could too. You say, what? Acts 1.8. You know Acts 1.8, don't you? But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you shall be my witnesses both in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and even to the remotest part of the earth. So that's how I pray. I pray for myself first and most because no one needs Jesus more than I do. And then I pray for my family. I move out. And, and then I pray for our elders, and I pray for our staff, and I pray for the people I'm discipling, and I pray for you. I pray for our church. And then I pray for our city and our state and our country and the world in ever-expanding circles. And after I have breakfast with Jesus, Jesus says, are you going to take me to work with you? And so I don't end my day with breakfast. I take Jesus with me and I get in my car. Do you know I have a car? I turn the key and it starts. Do you know how many people in human history would be staggered by that? Do we take things for granted? And I say, Jesus, thank you for a car and thank you for roads and Lord, thank you that I have a job. And thank you I have the ability to go to work. Thank you. And I have 15 minutes. I have 15 minutes from my house to work to pray. It is so good. And then I get to work. And every morning I try and meet with whoever wants to at 9 o'clock to pray. Because I like to pray with other people too. And so I pray again. And, and then when I'm headed to lunch, you know what I'm doing in the car? I'm praying. I'm praying the person I'm having lunch with that, that if they don't know Christ, that Jesus would open the door, that he'd give me boldness, that, that, that he would uh, help the person to understand if they're a Christian, that I might encourage them. And then as I'm driving home, as I'm driving home, I say, Lord, help me to love my wife the way you loved me. And then Karen and I eat dinner, and because we're reading the study together, we share with one another, what are you learning in the Word? What are you learning in the Word? And, uh, and after we talk about what we're learning, we pray together. It's not real long. We both pray twice. It's probably two or three minutes. It's short, but we pray together almost every day. I like praying with my wife, don't you? Oh, and you know the one I have breakfast with in the morning? When I lie in my bed, you know what I do? I talk to Jesus one last time, and I say, Jesus, thank you for getting me through today. And then I pray for all my family again. I, I, I pray for my family because I, I, I love my family, don't you? And, and, you know, after I pray for my family, you know what Jesus says? He says, I've got this. You can go to bed. I'll be up all night. You don't need to be. Oh, man, it's so good to go to bed at night knowing you have a friend who's got it, right? But I have to tell you, a lot of times I wake up at 3 in the morning, and, I, and I'm so worried and freaked out, and Jesus says, why are you up? I've got this. I've got this. You, you, you can go to sleep. Ah, I am so thankful to be a Christian. I'm so thankful that I get to have breakfast with Jesus, talk to him all day long and speak to him, and he enables me to sleep at night. And you can too, right? So enjoy Jesus this week. We get to do this. Let me ask you a question. Who do you know? Who do you know who would love to hear what you learned today? Won't you go and share with you? Hey, you know what we learned in church? We learned that we get to pray. Isn't that amazing? This week, when someone shares with you a fear or a hurt or a need, won't you say, could, could, could I share with you what we learned in church on Sunday? We learned that we get to pray. Would it be okay if I prayed for you? When people ask me to pray for them, I like to pray right then because if I don't, I'm likely to forget. 
And listen, you can do it too. When someone asks, shares with you about a fear or hurt or need, listen, would it be okay if I prayed for you? You can do it. You really, really can because you can enjoy Jesus all the time. Oh, imagine. Imagine the week we could have if we got up each day and said, we get to pray. We get to pray. And our great intention was to enjoy talking with Jesus all day long. Ah, what an amazing week we could have. Let's pray. Jesus, thank you for coming to seek and save sinners. Thank you for dying on the cross for our sins once and for all. And and thank you for rising and offering us the greatest gift ever, eternal life. Listen, if you've never received that gift, won't you? One day it's going to be too late. Please don't wait until it's too late. Jesus is here. Won't you receive him? Won't you tell him, Jesus, I've sinned against you and I'm sorry. And I believe you died on the cross for my sins and rose. And I want you to come into my life and and be my Savior and forgive me and give me eternal life. I want you to be Lord of my life. Help me be the person you want me to be. Well, if you've done that for the first time, way to go. Won't you mark it on your card? We'd love to celebrate with you. And Jesus, I pray for all of us who have received you that we would leave here rejoicing that we get to pray. And Lord, I pray tomorrow morning when we get up that we see you, Jesus, sitting there waiting, waiting for us to enjoy you, waiting for us to acknowledge our dependence upon you. And Lord, I pray that we would get up and have breakfast with you. And then, Lord, I pray tomorrow when we leave the house, we wouldn't leave you at home, we'd take you with us. And we would enjoy talking with you all day long. And Lord, I pray tomorrow... that when we lie our heads to bed at night, that we would talk to you as we go to sleep. And Lord, I pray that each of us, we'd have opportunities this week to share with others what we've learned. And that when people share with their, their struggles, we would have the opportunity to pray for them the way you pray for us. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.